Today I'm going to talk about the U.S. media coverage of the Daoyu Senkaku Islands dispute. So it's a little bit of a change from what you most recently heard in that this is an explicit sort of case analysis of one potential source of controversy in U.S.-China and of course in this case U.S.-China-Japan relationships. Uh, the Daoyu Senkaku Islands, I'm sure all of you know, although most Americans would not, are located uh, close to Taiwan off the coast of uh, China and uh, at the very tip of what Japan would claim as the end of Okinawa. Uh, they are unpopulated islands that have been highly contested for many years. The project that I'm reporting on today is part of a much more uh, comprehensive study and I'm going to give you one slice of one chapter. Uh, what I'm doing is producing a book that is supposed to be to the publisher uh, in, rough, uh, in rough form at least by the end of December. And what the book does is it looks at how populations in China, the US, and Japan all are making sense out of this controversy through the perspective, through the lens of their own national media systems, their own country's uh, media diplomacy, and, uh, and what happens in the textbooks that educate these, uh, that these uh, people. So I have chapters that are written by Chinese and Japanese scholars, chapters that focus on requirements for textbook construction and narratives of the relationship, primarily in China and Japan, uh, on, focused on the Sino-Japan Wars, one and two. Uh, chapters then that look at how legacy media covers this controversy in China, Japan, and the United States. And chapters on how social media discussions look at this controversy in China, Japan, and the United States. Finally, with some concluding chapters about the consequences for a controversy such as this one, given the demands of a new global economic order where we're actually seeing a, a confrontation potentially between the world's three largest economies. And so something that could go wrong here that could you know, even lead to a short-term incident of violence or even political instability, trade instability, could have dramatic economic consequences for the whole world. So that's the nature of the project. The uh, authors who are participating in the book itself, I'm taking the lead and assembled the team, and I'm writing an introductory chapter that contains a backdrop to the controversy and a chapter that evaluates uh, the competing claims to sovereignty that are offered by China and Japan and the basis for those claims historically and legally. And then the chapter on Japanese textbooks is written by Hiroko Okudo, uh, the chapter on Chinese textbooks by Shubo Li, uh, Takeshi Suzuki and Shisuke Murai of Meiji University are doing the chapters on Japanese legacy and social media. Uh, John Zhang of the University of Lugano is looking at Chinese legacy media. Elaine Yuan and Miao Feng of the University of Illinois Chicago are doing the chapters on Chinese social media. And Patricia Riley, my USC colleague, is doing a chapter on the consequences for this for the global order. Uh, Patty has written quite a bit on, on these kinds of topics, looking at uh, demands for global, uh, global law, global changes in how we think about controversies like this that would be disruptive of placing them within the, within the context only of single national uh, concerns. To drill down on the study I want to talk to you about today, though, it's just one part of that. It is also going to be one chapter in the book, and this will look at how U.S. legacy media has primarily talked about this controversy and how is it, it has shaped American understanding of what's happening with regard to the Daoyu Senkaku Islands. I looked explicitly in a critical content analysis at media coverage between 2011 up to the moment in 2013. I mean, literally every time I come across new information, I'll adapt and reflect and include it until I ship the thing off to the uh, publisher at the end of December. What I have discovered is that this issue has received ample coverage in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, Washington Post, Journal, the Christian Science Monitor, Times, Forum, Forbes, Bloomberg News and The Economist. The Economist clearly is a UK publication, but the reason I chose to include it is its largest circulation is in the US uh, rather than anywhere else in the world, and its perspectives, I think, are closely aligned with what other Americans would be learning from other sources. What I'm also finding is that most other publications and media outlets in the United States would not be doing any original reporting on this story. 
They might be taking AP feed, or they might be using the New York Times or LA Times news feeds, but they don't have reporters that are investigating this story. Even during the height of the civil disturbances in China, there wasn't original reporting being done by other US print media. The other thing I would find and report to you is that most of the coverage in the US, in terms of its thoroughness and its comprehensiveness, has been in the business-focused press. Forbes, Bloomberg News, places that focus on trade and the consequences for trade relationships, which is very instructive in that it gives you the sense that the lens through which Americans are likely to read this will either be event-driven, i.e. the protests, or larger framework stories that are placing it within the context of an economic uh, event that has some consequence and risk. What I'm also finding, and what the study does, is it focuses on emerging narratives in the media coverage of history, of the present, and of possible consequences for the future. So I'm really looking at press frames and how those press frames are indicative of countries, the statements by national leaders, for instance, that are designed to talk to their own domestic publics, to international publics, and to the publics uh, of the nations that might be concerned. So I do look, for instance, at attempts by Chinese publications in, in the, their country to talk to a Chinese audience, to communicate with Japan, and also to send a clear message to the, the other powers that may be involved in the controversy. What I'm finding is that much of the reporting focuses on the risks and dangers of escalations, and at the end we'll be evaluating in the book some of the solutions that are proposed for moving forward. Uh, in U.S. coverage now, and I shift at this point to explicitly look at U.S. coverage of the controversy, the most noteworthy characteristic of how the U.S. media talks about Yu is to emphasize that these are truly empty spaces. And it's almost done with a head-scratching incredulity that countries would risk going to war or risk controversy over such meaningless pieces of real estate. They're described as rocky islands, uninhabitable places, isolated specks. The better name would be goat islands. They're fish islands. Indeed, Daoyu, of course, does mean fish. Barren spaces and rocky atolls. And this coverage is in explicit contrast to the media analysis of Chinese and Japanese reports that would define these islands as sacred national territory. And what my Chinese and Japanese chapters say is both Chinese and Japanese media outlets are saying this is really vital to the integrity of the motherland. And in the United States, there's this absolute incredulity that this could be characterized as such. The other thing that I think is characteristic of this coverage is that the confrontation itself is frequently described as a disastrous game of chicken. And for those of you who may not be from the US culture, chicken was the game that teenagers would play when they would point their cars at each other and head toward a head-on collision and see who had the courage to blink and pull away and pull into their own lane at the last moment. So this is kind of the dominant media frame by which Americans are taught to characterize this controversy. There is an acknowledgment that these barren islands have oil resources, but the acknowledgment is that the oil will be difficult to exploit, the access to the oil will be a challenge because much of it will require very deep sea drilling, that the claims about the extent of the reserves are really unknown, that there are other sources of oil that could be developed and that shale oil, which the United States is currently moving toward what we call fracking, would be a better alternative than military confrontation over these islands, and that even if they were oil rich, the logical step the business press emphasizes would be international partnerships to jointly develop and share the resources in the area. But why risk a greater confrontation when sharing is clearly a solution? In terms of the media framing, there is no question absolutely no question that in the United States, it is China that is cast as the reckless upstart. China is cast as the power that is driving this controversy and creating the problem. And while China might have, in my own opinion, a uniquely reasonable claim to the legitimacy of their ownership uh, claims on the islands, the fact that the controversy over the Daoyu Islands is only one of many such controversies that China is at the moment playing out causes this controversy to be cast as no significantly different from the other territorial controversies. And so Americans who read their media are likely to see China as a country that can't get along with its neighbors. China is a country that's battling the Philippines, Vietnam, India, and of course Taiwan, so there's nothing really unique about what's happening here.
Media stories in the United States will consistently use language to refer to China as arguments that they're an arrogant power, an aggressive power, that they're expressing expansionist claims, and that this is a product of their newfound wealth. And they're almost cast as the careless spender, you know, who has wealth and, and then flaunts their money, flaunts their power, trying to create fear and, uh, and anxiety among their neighbors. And there is also a linkage of this perception of China with the uncertainty in the United States about China's great military expansion. In almost every media account you read, you'll hear about China's attempts to modernize weapon systems, to build the first aircraft carrier. American reporting does not necessarily express that this is an explicit threat to America, but it does give readers and, uh, and viewers the perception that this is a threat to its neighbors and that China's intentions are at least not clear and that China's intentions are enough to produce some anxiety. Many of you have heard, of course, of President Obama's pivot to the Pacific. This is all consistent with that argument that as the US withdraws forces from the Middle East, those forces are not going to lead to savings for those of us who have to pay taxes in America, but those resources are going to be shifted to the Pacific, which is perceived to be and characterized as a place of great anxiety. The Chinese goals are also clarified in these narratives and media frames. And the argument in most of the US press is that this isn't a real controversy. This is a cooked up, ginned up controversy that the Chinese Communist Party has deliberately used to distract domestic Chinese audiences from the real crises that they face at home. Crises of food safety, air and water pollution, growing income disparities, and a pervasive culture of corruption. So don't look at these problems. Look at this controversy with Japan is a way a dominant media frame in the United States characterizes this controversy. It also, as part of the transition to Xi Jinping, we saw much coverage in the United States that says Xi Jinping wants to be tough on this issue because by being tough on this issue, he sends a strong message that enables him to consolidate power. He sends a message to the military that he's not going to be weak and that he's going to be someone who will more boldly assert China's interest in the world. So many of these media narratives are, of course, embedded in narratives of character. It is also emphasized in US media that the communist uh, leadership celebrates things that would focus people's attention on their anger and hostility toward Japan. The fact that China celebrates a National Humiliation Day is frequently mentioned in the press. The fact that Chinese media coverage, and now I'm talking about US stories reporting what the People's Daily or Xinhua News Net is reporting, emphasizes often in these narratives that Chinese newspaper articles discussing the controversy frequently mention Japanese atrocities from, uh, from the last war and focus public anger on Japan's ambition and lack of trustworthiness. And is, it's effective. US media reports that we've seen dramatic shift in public opinion within China from 66% hostile attitudes toward uh, Japan to 87% hostile attitudes toward Japan. So clearly, as you know from every uh, football game that the two countries might have, there's a lot of hostile feelings that are be dri being driven as part of this controversy. Chinese control over the protests is also emphasized in US media. Stories in the US say China doesn't permit protests unless it wants protests. And on this controversy, they wanted protests. And that the police stood by. I mean, we see a lot of media narratives that says police stand by as Chinese mobs sack Japanese grocery stores, encircle Japanese factories, and even throw things, throw eggs and such at the Japanese embassy in, Taiwan, in, uh, in Beijing. So we see a huge amount of emphasis on the tolerance and even the decision to, to uh, create the protests. In fact, the US reporting says Chinese don't crack down on the protests until we get the incidents such as the one in Xi'an where a Chinese driver is pulled out of a Toyota and badly beaten. And then China says, whoops, maybe this may be going too far. We don't want quite that level of disorder. It may be difficult to control. And when Japanese firms begin to close, Japanese manufacturing plants, of course, that employ a lot of Chinese workers, then the Chinese government acts. But the narrative that constructs this is to say, this isn't all genuine rage. 
This is in fact created rage and it can easily be ramped up or closed down. There's one very interesting report where a reporter says he gets on his Twitter feed a note from the Chinese or the equivalent of Twitter, a note from the Chinese government say, please protest safely today. Here are the places where the protests will be encouraged. And so the reporter says, I know that the government is involved in encouraging these protests. Now the question, and it's a, a part of this, is how is Japan characterized in this US media coverage? And really the answer is quite favorably for the most part. Most US media coverage emphasizes Japan is mostly pacifist and not seeking a confrontation with China. But that Japan is deeply anxious about the rise of China, worried about its own shrinking role in the region and the world, unhappy that they were supplanted by China as the world's second largest economy. The largely favorable coverage in the US emphasizes that Japan has been the rational actor. And indeed that the national government purchase the islands from their private owners, not to send a message to China, but to prevent the rightists in Japan from doing something that might be even more provocative in China that would produce even more hostile relations. So we see quite favorable evaluations and media narratives of Japan in contrast to China. Of course, Japan is a longstanding ally of the United States. If there is criticism of Japan, and there is some, there is an acknowledgment that Japan hasn't fully acknowledged its wartime guilt, that decisions by Japanese leaders to go to the shrines to honor war criminals produce controversy. Shinzo Abe, is, who is a USC graduate, I might add, is frequently characterized in the US media as a hawk, and his party is characterized as nationalistic and as patriotic. So we do see some elements that might say Japan has some contribution. There is, however, no significant questioning whatsoever in US media coverage of Japan's motives in military expansion, which China, of course, has negative coverage on. And I can tell you that even my Japanese reporting uh, from the chapters on Japan I've already seen in draft form, there's a lot of criticism in Japan that Shinzo Abe is not just a nationalist or a hawk, but that he's really a dangerous right winger who has stirred up the right wing in Japan. You don't see any of that coverage in the United States media analysis. In terms of risk scenarios, I just sampled one which I could share with you. Most of the emphasis on risk says this is really a very dangerous situation. And you can read this for yourself to get a sense of precisely how provocative this is characterized as something that could potentially uh, threaten peace in the world. A lot of this analysis focuses on the fact of error. You know, two ships run into each other or two airplanes bump into each other or we get a renegade kind of captain who goes beyond where the orders of, of his commands would have taken him and suddenly an incident is created and we get very rapid escalation scenarios that become very difficult. Now, what's missing from US coverage? We have no recognition in US media of US culpability for anything that happened here. The US chose to return these islands to Japan, even though it did so while stating it assumed no position on ownership. But there is no acknowledgment yet, you know, maybe that wasn't such a wise move. There is virtually no discussion of critical responsibility for the US and almost no article suggesting specific strategies for how the US could move the controversy forward. When Secretary of Defense Hegel called upon Tokyo, he acknowledged for the first time explicitly that these islands were covered by the US security agreement with Japan. His statements in which he in fact refers to the islands only as the Senkaku Islands, which was in and of itself instructive, produced massive media coverage in Japan and China. They got almost no media attention in the United States. It's like the United States didn't even really want to acknowledge that he had said something that constituted a significant shift in US opinion. Instead, most media articles in the United States say, if Japan thinks they can just take any kind of action they want here, they better be concerned because, quote, the US has no stomach for this fight. We don't really perceive this as an issue that we're willing to go to war for. There is, however, a great complexity about the genuineness, seriousness, and integrity of the US security agreement versus Japan, and the risk that if the United States blinks in the face of an aggressive or, or uh, 
confrontational China, then other powers in the region might be even more inclined to try to develop their own nuclear weapons and such. And so some of the rhetoric in the United States emphasizes that the US has been the stable power. US global hegemony is what is responsible for the rise both of China and Japan, and that both countries should recognize that it's because of the projection of US power in the region that we haven't had nuclear proliferation and we have had stable relationships between these nations. Both China and the US should respect the US role and should engage us as partners instead of engaging in brinkmanship. US media coverage does say, though, that we just wish this issue would go away. We just wish Asian, Asian leaders would learn to get along, kind of a Rodney King, for those of you who are from LA, can't we just get along kind of view of the world? And that the US has very much become a status quo power in the region. We don't want disruption. We don't, as I think my predecessor said, we're okay with the relationship with China being no better than it is, we just don't want it to be worse than it is. And we're very focused, I think, on status quo power. As I've said, what's missing in US coverage is any discussion of the legitimacy of the claims advanced by China or Japan on these islands. There is almost no mention of Taiwan in US press. Even though Taiwan has also staked a claim on these islands, we don't want to get into that because Taiwan only complicates our relationships with China. Actually, the smart thing for the US to do would have been to return these islands to the control of Taiwan instead of to Japan, who probably had a very legitimate claim. But at the time that that decision was made, Nixon was trying to cozy up to Beijing, and he was trying to keep confident Tokyo. And so that was an option that was never, you can imagine, actively considered. There is also no discussion in US media of Okinawa or the historical role of Okinawa in this dispute. And in fact, the contestation that even giving Okinawa back to Japan was a controversial decision and could have been justified quite differently based upon historical claims. There is little discussion of the complexity of the security agreement, but there's significant discussion of the motives for Chinese military expansion. I think we, we would be better served if our public better understood why a rising power like China has an interest in developing its military capacity. I think that's, that's something that makes why sense that we would understand that, but you see no media coverage that says, why shouldn't China have an aircraft carrier when so many of their goods travel by sea? Uh, and China has as much interest as, as the people who buy their products in stable sea lanes. Um, coverage is emphatically skewed, and I think I've already most made most of these arguments. The one thing I want to emphasize is China is not cast as a partner for the US. And that is a failure of Chinese media diplomacy, right? If China wants to affect positive change with regard to this kind of controversy, then the Beijing government has to do a much better job of telling China's story in such a way that China is not going to be cast as the aggressor, not only in the US, but by other countries in the region, and China becomes a stable partner. Uh, we saw some glimpse that this was happening over North Korea, for instance, but I think it's been an underexploited opportunity for China to demonstrate rational, calm leadership in the world. Thank you.